A Warhammer Novel Witch Hunter Matthias Fullman, Volume 1 Written by C.L. Werner This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death, and of the world's ending. Amidst all the fire, flame and fury, it is a time too of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the empire, the largest and most powerful of the human realms. Known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers, it is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests and vast cities. And from the throne in Altdorf reigns the emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the knightly palaces of Bretonia to icebound Kislev in the far north, come rumblings of war. In the towering world's edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of ratfangs, the skaven, emerging from the sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wildernesses there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever near, the empire needs heroes like never before. Prologue Dark thunderheads rolled across the sky, drowning out the light cast by moon and star, their brooding grey substance taking on the hue of blood, where the last feeble rays of the dying sun struck them. Beneath the clouds sprawled a landscape no less sinister and menacing, no less redolent of dark powers and the malevolence of the night. Once the sprawl of rack and ruin had been a city, the jewel of the Ostermark, a place of such wealth and power as to rival even great cities like Altdorf and Marienburg, eclipsing even the majesty of the mighty river which flowed beneath its gates and passed its straits. But such glories were now part of the past, destined to never return. The vibrant cityscape had been crushed and broken, Naked beams, blackened by fire, clawed at the dark sky like lost souls reaching up from the pits of Cain's hell. The once steaming streets were now deserted and desolate, choked in rubble and debris and the sorry remnants of the unburied dead. Marble fountains spat foul black water into weed-choked basins. Stained glass windows stared at muck-ridden lanes from the sagging plaster walls in which they had been set. Everywhere, the last remnants of the city's opulence fought a losing war against the decay that crawled from the hungry earth to consume what the night of doom had left behind. A foul, clammy mist rose from the stagnant waters of the river Stir, crawling down the streets and alleys of the destroyed city, carrying with it the promise of cough, fever, and plague. Like everything else around the city, even the mighty stir had become tainted by the evil of this blighted place, its waters so choked with rubble from collapsed buildings and piers that the flow was almost completely stopped, and the once clean waters were now as foul and stagnant as a toad pond. A bloated black rat the size of a terrier crept from a crack in the only remaining wall of what had once been a resplendent merchant residence now little more than a heap of blackened wood and crumbling plaster. The whiskers on the rat's mud-spattered face twitched for a moment, as the animal tried to separate the multitude of stenches that washed over it, lashing its naked tail as it sniffed out its surrounds. A carrion stench aroused its interest, and the oversized rodent scrabbled across the mound of brick and timber, beady red eyes gleaming with hungry anticipation. Not far from the collapsed debris of the high-class home, another pile of wreckage groped at the night sky with talons of masonry and wood. What these ruins had been, none could say, but they must have belonged to some tall and vast building, as the sprawl of the rubble gave silent testimony. From the height of the mound, a man might be able to see far across the ruins, or, if some spark of wisdom guided his sight, the broken walls that demarked the limits of what had once been a city. 
signposts to guide the lost back to the sane world beyond the desolation. A much closer signpost had been placed upon the highest swell of the rubble. A great iron spike, some twelve feet high, maybe once the support for the bed of a wagon or the hull of a boat, rose out of the debris, pointing upwards like an accusing finger. Upon it had been lashed an old carriage wheel, the rich colors of its paint flaking away in the ill air filling the city. Lashed to the wheel was a bundle of sorry and ragged remnants, the faded debris of a soldier's livery clinging to the pallid bones. Who he had been, or what had he done to deserve such a fate, no one could say. Not even if he had been alive or dead before earning his seat high above the rubble. The skeleton had long ago been picked clean by crows and ravens, and even the last scraps of meat had been stripped away by the inch-long ants which now infested great sections of the ruins. A scrap of parchment bearing the last vestiges of a wax seal was the only sign of who the unfortunate victim might have been or what he might have done. The grimy rain had faded away whatever account of his misdeeds had once been recorded there, and the wind had torn away nearly all that the rain had spared, leaving the skeleton to ignore its shame in anonymity. The bloated rat leapt across the uneven rubble, hopping from one mass of stone to the other, and scrabbled up the base of an iron pole, its curled claws finding an easy purchase on the corroded metal. The rodent perched on the crude wooden sign that some passerby in a moment of morbid humor had affixed to the forgotten gibbet. In dark charcoal letters that rain and fog had yet to devour, the jokester's hand had scrawled, Welcome to Mordheim. The vermin paid no heed to the bony remains hanging above its head. That meal had been finished long ago. The rat was more interested in the new smell its keen senses had detected, the stench of rotting meat and old blood. The rat lingered for a moment upon the perch, and then leapt back to the ground, scrabbling down the heap of stones, then scuttling away down one of the narrow dingy streets. There was a frantic haste to its gait, for this was Mordheim and even rats knew better than to tempt the dark gods by tearing too long in the open upon the forsaken streets. Sounds of conflict arose from a square several score yards from where the ghastly welcome sign had been set. Once, perhaps, this had been a place where the good and great of the city might have gathered to compare fashions and gossip, to idle away the day watching ships sailing upon the river. But such frivolity had no place in Mordheim now. The square, like everything else in the city, had been consumed by decay. For every building that leaned sickly against its neighbor to lend a support, free had crumbled, as though some giant hand had pressed upon them from above and pushed them flat. The square was some forty yards on the side, and within its entire expanse could be found not a single inch which was not tainted and ruined. The small garden that had been lovingly tended in the center of the square was now choked with weeds. The trunk of an old oak tree, which had shaded the flower beds, warped and twisted. Malevolent faces seemed to stare from the mottled, sickly wood, and though the eager carrion crows gathered in the broken gable roofs that yet faced the square, the desiccated branches of the tree were absent of their croaking black shapes. The paving stones were cracked and chipped sickly yellow weeds stabbing upward from beneath them. The rat crinkled its nose as it sniffed the crimson stain leading into the square, its slimy pink tongue licking at a salty fluid. The greedy vermin sniffed at the air once more, trying to decide if it was too early or too late to follow the trail to a meal. The sound of steel clashing upon steel told the vermin it was still too soon, and with an almost dejected manner, the creature crept back into the sanctity of the rubble-choked gutter. With a groan, the warrior staggered back, his gloved hand clutching at the crimson seeping from his belly. The soldier looked in disgust at the thing that had dealt him the wound, the crimson gleaming from its dark, rust-pitted blade. His enemy didn't seem to notice in the slightest that he had harmed its opponent. That the man yet lived seemed to be its only observation. Indeed, if the two pasty orbs that stared emptily from the mouldering ruin of its face were capable of observing anything. The undead thing took a shambling step towards the soldier, 
its decaying arm raising its rusty sword once more. The warrior gritted his teeth against the pain surging from the cut this grave-cheating horror had inflicted upon him, struggling to lift its shield to intercept the zombie's attack. The weight of the shield seemed to have increased, and he realized that slow as the zombie was, his own reactions were slower still. Once again, the rusty sword sank into the soldier's belly. A surge of pain flashed through the man's body like a bolt of fire. With a savage cry, the soldier swung his hammer around, the heavy steel smashing against the zombie's withered skull. The undead thing uttered no sound, as the brittle bones were crushed and the maggot-infested mire of morbid fluid and the greasy pulp which had been its brain was splashed across the grimy cobblestones. Rather, with a quiet acceptance, it crumpled to the ground, as if welcoming the second chance to quit this wholesome world of the living and return to the silent gardens of Moor. The warrior watched his twice-slain foe crumple, then fell himself upon the debris-ridden ground. The soldier stared into the darkening sky, watching as the last feeble rays of the sun turned the ominous clouds as crimson as the fluid leaking out of his body. For a moment, he fancied that it was not the sun that had transformed the black thunderheads, but the greedy storm gods, sopping up all the blood spilled this day across the foul streets of accursed Mordheim. The warrior clenched his eyes as if to make the image disappear. So close to death, grim storm gods were not the best thing to dwell upon. The duel between the soldier and his undead foe over, all sounds of conflict ended. The ambush had been swift and sodden, felling man and undead thing alike with great speed. There had been twenty in the soldier's warband, and a pack of rotten enemies that had attacked them had numbered at least as many. Now the warrior could hear distinctly the moans of wounded comrades and the hideous croaking of crows. The carrion-eaters had grown bold beyond measure in the wretched environs of Mordheim and didn't bother to wait for the body to become still before setting upon it with their cruel beaks and sharp claws. Nor did they retreat any great distance when their mangled meals summoned up the strength to swat at them with maimed arms and bleeding stumps, hopping away only far enough that they might savor their wretched efforts with some assurance of impunity. The birds would then return to their loathsome repast, and no cry of wrath or pain or mercy would cause them to cease their labor. The soldier clutched at the wound again, this time not to quench the flow of blood, but to encourage it. With the horrible scavengers cawing and croaking all around him, death could not come soon enough. The sounds of the crows grew agitated, and then to the soldier's dimming senses came the sound of boots rasping across the unclean cobblestones. The warrior tried to turn his head to see who was walking towards him, but found that the effort was beyond him. It didn't matter. Whether friend or foe, there was little more that could be done to the veteran swordsman now. So, a cold voice spoke from somewhere near. This is how it ends. The voice was hard and imperious, a slight lisp twisting every consonant into a sneer. It was a voice the soldier had heard before, a voice he knew well. Though he couldn't see who was addressing him, the soldier knew who it was. Somehow, it didn't surprise him. If anyone could have emerged from the horrible ambush alive and unscathed, that man would have been Witch Hunter Captain Helmuth Klausner. The boots rasped across the cobblestones once more. Into the warrior's fading vision came a pale face with a square jaw and sunken eyes nose and chin both cast in such a manner as to make the visage of a devil seem kindly. Helmuth Klausner leaned down, gloved hand touching the hole in the man's belly. The soldier grimaced in pain, amazed that such a sensation could still intrude upon the darkness obscuring the other senses. The witch-hunter gazed indifferently at the bloody bile coating the fingers of his glove and wiped his hand upon the soldier's tunic. All these weeks... All these weeks of cat and mouse, lurking within these unhallowed ruins, and finally it comes to an end. Helm of Stone was almost regretful. All these long weeks, stalking and hunting, 
not knowing for certain who was hunter and who was prey. And now... The witch hunter allowed himself a slight chuckle. Now it comes to this. He stared back down at the soldier, and this time even the mask of indifference had fallen away from the raffle malevolence that blazed in the witch hunter's eyes. Where is he, Otto? Helmuth demanded, his words so short and rapid that even their normal lisp was clipped. You have seen him. He was here. Otto stared into the gruesome countenance of Helmuth Klausner. Once, that face had cowed him, had broken his will with terror and fear. But no longer. He was beyond the reach of even Helmuth Klausner now. The one the witch hunter hunted would see to that. A slight laugh bubbled its way from the dying soldier's throat. Damn you! Otto gasped. Damn your black soul, Helmuth. May, may the dark gods, may they know you for one of their own. Helmuth Klausner glared at the dying man as he cursed the witch hunter. A cruel smile split the Templar's harsh features. Swift as a striking serpent, he stabbed the soldier deep in the chest with the long silver dagger that he was carrying. Otto gave voice to a gurgled rattle as life fled out of him. I'll not be seeing them for some time. Klausner sneered down at the corpse. Not until my work is done. You might tell them that when you'll see them. The witch hunter rose from the carcass, eyes surveying the carnage around him. The ambush had been a costly affair, but he didn't lose anything that he couldn't replace. Swords were more plentiful than grain in the vicinity of Mordheim, and hands to wield them even cheaper. His prey might have escaped him this day, but it would not elude him forever. Sooner or later, the light of Sigmar would find the creature that he sought, no matter how deep and dark the burrow into which it fled. Helmuth suddenly became aware of a perceptible chill, a fell odor upon the air. It was a stench of corruption rather than decay or death, the stink of evil, twisted and inhuman. The crows rose from their loaves and meals, cawing in fright as they retreated into the shadowy garrets of the tumble-down guild halls. Slowly, the witch hunter turned to face the source of the taint. It stood within the shadows, cast by that great malformed oak, a tall figure clothed in black. The vestment of the creature was ragged and frayed, the once elegant material torn and dirty, hanging loosely about a figure grown too lean to properly fill it. Thin, pallid hands hung from the sleeves of the robe, the once elegant cuffs shorn away. A large gold ring dominated the finger of one of its hands held against the shriveled digit of a crude iron nail, a spike driven through both jewelry and the finger bone beneath. Helmuth smiled as he saw the ring. Any question as to the identity of the adversary banished at last. You! The shadowy apparition spoke, the sound less like speech and more like the creaking of wood under the attention of a midnight wind. And I... Things have ended much as they began so many years ago. The figure strode forward, the pale, sunken face revealed in the fading twilight. The flesh was beginning to flake and peel, blotches of black necrotic skin marring the dead pallor. Great incisors, like the fangs of a rat, pushed apart the shadow's face, spreading apart the bloodless white lips. The only color in the face was contained in the two fiery eyes gleaming from the sunken pits which flanked its decaying nose. The eyes stared with a lifetime of hatred and fury upon the figure of Helmuth Klausner, burning with a perfection of hatred that no human could ever hope to emulate, at least not without collapsing under the strain of containing such malice. Helmuth Klausner nodded his head slightly at the monster, drawing the sword sheathed at his side. Indeed, Sigmar could not allow such a thing as you to profane this world with your puerile mockery of life. The witch hunter spoke, 
his own tones cold with the extremes of fury. It is by his grace that I am the one appointed the task of restoring you to the grave you have denied so long. The monster stepped towards Helmuth, its pace so fluid that it seemed to glide across the cobblestones. If there are any gods of justice and vengeance, then it is they who guided my steps. I will have what is mine. I will have restored to me all that you have taken. The creature's voice was terrible in its subtle violence, its undercurrents of ire and wrath. We have talked long enough, blood leech. The hour grows late, and I have little time to waste trifling with a corpse. Helmuth Klausner advanced towards the shadowy figure, his sword held before and across his body. The shadow drew its own blade, gliding forward to meet its foe. The dull, subdued tones of an incantation slithered into the quickening night. As they did so, the corpse of Otto began to twitch with unnatural life. Thus did witch-hunter captain Helmuth Klausner, Knight Templar of Sigmar, protector of the faith, drive to final and perpetual ruin the thrice-accursed vampire Sibakai in those dark and fearsome times. Upon the streets of foul-benighted Mordheim did he bring the wrath and judgment of holy Sigmar upon that foul undead abomination. Or so say the histories written of those distant days. <laughs>